So maybe, first of all, could you tell me why exactly is there need for such a guide? Because, I mean, there is a lot of regulation going on in the field, isn't there? Yeah, thanks. I think uh, maybe since 2010, when this big tech clash started across Europe, there's been more growing awareness that platform economy needs to do better than it has done. Um, and I think there's now widespread kind of like criticism and awareness that especially the big platforms, you know, Google, uh, Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, so GAFAM, that their business model leads to problematic outcomes. And I think this has led almost to a spiritual crisis of platform capitalism that, uh, you know, if you talk to young people, if you talk to students, for instance, at our institute, uh, you know, th these, these platforms now have a very bad reputation and, you know, people, users try to avoid them. So I think there's a widespread recognition that something is wrong with platform capitalism. As you mentioned, regulation has started to really um, st be strengthened at the European level and at national levels. But I think what we're lacking from the debate is an understanding of what platforms can actually do to do better mm -hmm. and what the alternatives are that are out there. And so this is where the strategic guide is supposed to come in. It's supposed to show that platforms aren't inherently and not necessarily bad corporate actors, that there are platform business models that can lead to more favorable outcomes for societies. Yeah, the regulation is important and it's happening and it's going to happen even more. And regulation can set the boundaries, the legal boundaries within which you do platform business. But then platform companies still have to figure out what is, what is their mission? What is that they're trying to do in the world? It used to be the case that platform companies and internet companies more generally were supposed to be changing the world for the better. And they had this clear mission and, and drive and it was helping them recruit smart young people and it was start helping them to win over consumers and, and suppliers. And now we're at a, almost an opposite um, point where the societal debate is about how do we deal with this massive threat of uh, platform companies. And regulation can mitigate the problems and set the kind of boundaries, but regulation can sort of do the business for the platforms and, and figure out if, if there is a future for platforms that is constructive and, and socially uh, beneficial, then what is that going to be? And I think that the guide is going to, by highlighting some examples, from a lot of platform companies that actually exist out there that are not the, the dominant ones, by highlighting some of those models, I think it's going to provide some guidance. Okay, so let's maybe go right into the guide. Uh, how exactly is it built up? On the high level, the guide is divided into five different domains. In each of these domains, we first present the dominant model, what it is that these big uh, platform giant companies are doing in these areas. Areas like uh, you know, their responsibility or lack, the, lack of responsibility towards uh, the users of the platform, uh, their responsibility towards the wider society and environment and so on. So in each of the domains we explain what is basically the dominant model mm -hmm. that these giants are doing. And then we outline a spectrum of alternative models. And these alternative models, when I say spectrum, I mean a spectrum basically starting from the most commercially viable, easiest to implement in the current uh, economic and business environment, mm -hmm. all the way to the most radical uh, ideas, which are, you know, maybe not business viable for a venture capital funded um, a startup that's seeking uh, massive growth, but that are actually being used and, and operated today by platform cooperatives and, and other uh, platform organizations that have the ideology and the sort of uh, responsibility more at the center of their business. We try to highlight that there's no heroes and villains here, mm -hmm. right? There's a spectrum of possibilities that are alternative to the dominant model. And depending on the market position of the company, depending on the resources of the company, you can do more and you can do, you can do less. And we show that there's examples of basically idealism driven mm -hmm. companies that just you know, want to do better. And that's their, that's their primary goal. That's their primary reason for existence. Often these 
the platform cooperatives. The entire platform cooperative as a movement uh, is inspired by that idea. Uh, we have to we have to invent platform capitalism that is more sustainable. But it doesn't have to be that. Uh, you know, radical. It mm -hmm. can also be regular businesses trying to make money, but implementing a few small steps that can go a long way mm -hmm. to improve conditions. Across all of these five domains, um, people have been saying a lot of these things before. So many academics have drawn attention to the problems of the dominant platform business model, basically. And many academics, policymakers, uh, activists have proposed alternatives. Mm -hmm. And what we've done basically in this guide is first of all to sum up, to summarize a lot of the discussion as we see it, put some structure into it, divide it into five different domains, uh, distinguish between the dominant model mm -hmm. um, and the alternatives. And very importantly, present uh, examples and cases of real European platform companies that are actually following some of these alternative strategies. So they're not just uh, wishes and principles, but something that is being uh, executed on the marketplace mm -hmm. at this very moment. And another thing that we're doing is we're um, looking across all of the different sectors of platform business, from e-commerce and, and the gig economy to uh, social media and, and, and so on. So we think that there are, at a certain level of, of abstraction, there are certain um, strategies, both problematic dominant ones as well as certain alternative ones, that are essentially um, common to more or less all of the uh, platform companies. Okay, that's interesting. So maybe we could go into the domains themselves. Uh, the first one, uh, Nicolas, is uh, responsibility towards active users. Maybe you could tell me what, you know, illustrate what you mean when you say spectrum. The domain that is about responsibility for active users, so these are the, the people, the firms that actually contribute value through the platform to the platform. To me, that one is core to the entire um, guide because platforms are gatekeepers, right? They are in the middle of the market, basically setting the terms for both sides of the market. And the dominant model here is to basically skim off for the platform itself as much of the value as possible while offloading the risk and the cost to, um, the, the, to, the, to, the, to the active users. Um, and often it's, you know, very con uh, it creates a lot of convenience for one side of the market, so let's say in e-commerce, uh, while it creates uh, very challenging conditions for the other side of the market, say suppliers in an e-commerce that have to uh, adhere to certain terms and have to carry the risk of product development. Um, so this is the dominant model. Uh, what can alternatives do? What are the strategies that we've found? Um, so linking it back again to the spectrum, I think the least that should be done is make this cost and risk uh, transparent to both sides of the market. So uh, to use GeekWork as an example, uh, because there it's very clear, couriers that deliver food uh, from restaurants, um, they're often employed um, as freelancers, right? Um, not as full employees. Now that comes with risk for their social protection, for their health insurance, what if they have an accident. That comes with risk for their pension uh, in the long run. They don't accumulate entitlements, right? So uh, we say that the least that platforms can then do is make these gig workers, these couriers, aware of these risks um, uh, in the long run. And then um, they can make decisions about how they want to mitigate this risk more, uh, you know, autonomously. Um, and if you wanted to go uh, more extreme, which, um, you know, as mentioned, is maybe not viable for a VC um, funded company, you could um, redistribute the value directly to um, the, the active user. So this often happens when there are cooperatives or collectives that stay in the gig work uh, and the, the delivery platform example. So there are collectives of um, couriers that basically run the platforms themselves and then obviously the value that they create through the platform they redistribute to the couriers um, uh, directly. Maybe we could move on to the second domain because I, uh, when I read that wider societal and environmental uh, impacts that's very broad isn't it? Uh, how do you tackle that then in within 
the idea of presenting a spectrum. And we wanted to highlight that like any um, business, platform companies also have to be aware of their wider impacts on the environment and society. So, you know, at the outset, that's the same for any company. You have an ecological footprint, you have certain externalities, as economists would call it, that where you have effects on, on the world um, around you. But we also want to highlight in this domain that platforms have um, uh, influenced the, uh, these things in particular ways because the dominant model is based on scaling as fast as possible. And also it's based on using existing infrastructures. So these are roads and bridges, but also digital infrastructures like credit cards, payment infrastructures, etc., logistics infrastructures. So the dominant platforms really make use of these established structures while not taking on any of the of the cost. You know, e-commerce is, is the best example. Packages are shipped often, things are returned and then destroyed because that's more cost efficient than to recycle or repurpose those articles. And so then on the alternative side, we show that platforms through their uh, you know network effect based um, model also have an opportunity to um, do uh, to, to do uh, quite a lot of good in minimizing these costs and helping the actors that depend and work through the platform to do better. Mm -hmm. So here the best example is maybe um, delivery platforms that then uh, incentivize and encourage uh, restaurants to use less packaging or to do, use more ecologically friendly packaging to also optimize the delivery routes. Um, so here then the platform can have an influence on the suppliers to um, you know, do things in a more ecologically sustainable way. The one area where this is really visible is taxation. So the dominant model and the conventional wisdom in business is that businesses will do whatever is legally permissible, really push the boundaries of what is legally permissible to minimize uh, their taxation and not really be really proactive um, about paying taxes. But in some of the European platform businesses, what we see is that they are um, actually working together with, in some countries, with tax agencies to try to make, for instance, the taxation of gig work as transparent and as efficient um, as possible so that it's both for the end users so for the, the, the gig workers it's uh, it's convenient it's uh, zero administrative um, overhead and also from society's perspective uh, it's certain that there's no uh, tax uh, avoidance or evasion going on so let's move on to the third uh, domain algorithmic management of content products and stakeholders uh, that is very dense. Could you tell me something about that? Basically, in any platform, you know, whether it's e-commerce or social media uh, or, or delivery or something, the platform is making matches between one side of the market and the other side of the market. Um, and in practice, that can happen, for instance, by, through ranking search results. So you're searching for something and you get search results in some order. Mm -hmm. Now the order in which you get those search results is not obvious. It's determined by an algorithm and something goes into that algorithm uh, to, to determine uh, how it works. And here, uh, platform companies can basically, they can do a lot of good, but they can also do a lot of nasty things. And when I say nasty things, one of the things that they can do is self-preferencing, right? So if you're an e-commerce platform or an app store, you ensure that your own products always show up at the top of the list, regardless of how relevant they are to what the consumer is actually looking for. And so that's obviously not good uh, business. Uh, well, it's good business perhaps in the short run, if you want to be a giant extractive uh, platform company, but it's not responsible and therefore we think not really a sustainable way um, to run a large part of the economy 
uh, in the long run. And I think it becomes uh, apparent when you look at these and look at this from the end user perspective, right? We, we, perspective we all have are familiar with e-commerce platforms and so forth. But even from the other side of the market, so if uh, if I'm a driver on a ride-sharing app, like which uh, customers that are looking for rides will be shown to me? Mm -hmm. uh, what information will I be presented with about my peers' ride and so forth? So it's basically the management of information through through algorithms. And this is an area where the regulator is now pushing up the minimum requirements, right? So we've got the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act coming through uh, EU and basically increase the requirements for these large platform companies to actually provide that kind of recourse and provide the, some of that transparency, but also the ability for users to question the uh, uh, outcomes and the decisions, the algorithmic decisions uh, that are being made. I think the notion of um, more democratic is, is important here, more democratic, more participatory, because at least the dominant platforms, they have become kind of the rule makers, almost like government-like rule makers. But if they are the rule makers of markets, mm -hmm. then there needs to be ways for them to be held accountable, or at least make the decisions transparent, that we understand how these decisions come about. And I think this is uh, the, the, the idea behind this domain. Okay, so democratization is a good keyword, um, I feel, to lead on to the next domains. As Nicholas mentioned, um, platform companies have become these big rule makers now, at least the giant companies. And we have this idea, at least in democratic societies, that those who have power, those who rule, should be held accountable in one way or the other. And basically the, the domains four and five um, of our of our guide relate to that. So the fourth domain, which is interoperability standards and data sharing, that gets at the problem of accountability from the perspective of allowing people to vote with their feet. So the dominant model uh, is that these platform giants are essentially trying to make it as hard as possible for uh, people to leave the platform by um, constructing these walled gardens, by uh, not using standards, um, by essentially just making it very difficult to interoperate with other services. And I think domain four is also a good example of intersections between the different domains. I mean, we try to divide the different domains for, for clarity because there are different aspects of the alternative business models that platforms have to consider, but there are certainly intersections. So for instance, this notion of data sharing, um, there's a lot of potential, I think, there for, for alternative models. One is the sharing of data with competitors, yes, but also with the users themselves, right? Can you give users more insight on the uh, their behavior online, their opportunities on the platform. So for instance, if you're a business on an e-commerce platform, could you be provided with detailed um, information and data about which consumers wear, um, like your products, and what is, what is behind that? Then tell me about the last domain. The fifth domain is more about um, allowing the users of the platforms directly to influence how the platform is being managed. And this might be necessary in many cases where because of network effects, for instance, you're never going to have a situation where uh, multiple small platforms are competing for users on a platform and competition works as an effective way of, of reducing the power of the platform companies and, um, and holding them to account. Sometimes this is just not going to happen because of network effects and various other reasons. And so then the fifth domain asks, well, how, what ways are there for people to get directly involved in managing that platform if it's not going to be possible for them to switch to an alternative mm -hmm. if they don't like it, right? And um, the dominant model, essentially, is to run the platform as a corporate fiefdom, as, you know, not give the users any sort of voice or, or even transparency into how decision-making uh, is happening inside the platform company. Mm. 
and uh, insofar as as user voice is taken into account or heard, it's through the paradigm of, of customer service and, and, and marketing. I think alternative models would you know, either acknowledge that and then create uh, accountability and say for other voices, um, for instance through corporate boards that then represent other stakeholders, or they would have a completely different founding process to begin with. So, you know, of course we have to mention platform cooperatives here, where the entire idea is, can a collective of users um, create a platform business that then works for all users and where the value is shared and where decisions are made together. Of course, there need to also be forms of representation. Not every individual user can carry every single decision, but then already there's, by definition, a democratic governance model where all the users themselves make the decisions. I feel we need to address the European angle uh, and maybe also, since so much thought went into it, I would like to ask you about um, your motivation uh, to come up with this guide in the first place and, and uh, what led to it. So the, the European angle in all of this is, well, first of all, the European Union really is recognized as a, as a sort of pioneer and, and trendsetter in some ways in digital regulation. And he really is pushing forward now with Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act and so on. And uh, that is really creating an occasion for platform businesses to reconsider what it is that they're all about. Mm. Um, the other thing is that in Europe, we do have traditions everywhere in the world. There are different kinds of traditions of participatory governance and, 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 and democracy and so on. But we have particular forms in Europe, including uh, in business, co-determination and the social partnership, which means bargaining and, 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 and agreements between employer side um, and worker side on the one hand. So we have these sort of traditions of, you could even say social, social democracy. And so the question is, can the platform economy somehow evolve to incorporate um, some of these principles mm -hmm. or uh, evolve in such a way that becomes compatible with these European institutions so that it doesn't always have to exist in sort of conflict mm -hmm. uh, where the regulator has to come always and say, stop, don't do that, but that it could in fact become part of the established uh, European political economy. And I think, um, you know, what you alluded to, to earlier, um, you know, platforms are, um, don't want to be, European platforms don't want to be associated with the big um, transnational platforms. So they are very deliberately and actively trying to curate and, and, and create a European identity, frame themselves as European rather than American or, or Chinese actors, which then allows them to look better towards the, the end users, but also towards recruits you know it's it's become a problem that people don't want to work at a platform company anymore because it's somehow frowned upon so really there is a, a you know a, across the continent um, uh, platform organizations developing and very much emphasizing their European identity so if there is a, a widespread awareness of all this and also a willingness uh, to um, balance uh, some of the more problematic tendencies out uh, what are your hopes for this guide and uh, how would you like uh, platform businesses to respond to it and engage with it? I think we try to set a strategic guide here to be basically concrete. Now we don't offer you know, an off-the-shelf guide to how to run your platform business, but we provide a lot of examples that are very concrete mm -hmm. and that are also in most cases viable. So I think the first step to us will be that other platform businesses read this guide and see what others have done to even you know, begin to understand the alternatives that are already out there, that are already being implemented. Because I think in the public discourse, in the policy discourse, 
when we think of platforms, we often think of the big ones, the Googles, the Amazons. But even the platforms themselves and the stakeholders often trouble to uh, have trouble to get out of this mindset that they have to somehow copy the model of the big ones and compete with them on, on their terms. Mm -hmm. And this should hopefully show to them alternatives are available, they're viable. They may not make you the, the winner that takes it all, but they will help you to be sustainable also in the long run, including for your stakeholders.